Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Better Call Saul Season 4 Episode 1 Smoke. This video is a part of a series of videos where I review episodes of Better Call Saul, so I'll have to start with a spoiler warning for Better Call Saul uh, up to the end uh, of uh, the Season 4 premiere. Smoke, if you haven't seen up to this point, you will not want to watch this video, otherwise some things will be spoiled for you. So, uh, Better Call Saul... I believe is the only show I've actually covered on my channel since the very first episode. Like I covered every single solitary episode, uh, started beginning with the very first episode. I think this is actually also true for Star Trek Discovery, but that's only had one season, so that doesn't count. Better Call Saul. This is beginning their four seasons, so this is <laughs> this is one show I and I plan on sticking with it to the end, every single episode. It's an amazing show, but I don't always have every a uh, lot of things to say about each episode. Uh, I one of the commenters in my season three reviews pointed out that as at the start of pretty much every review for that season, I was like, well, not much happened in this episode, and I kept saying that a lot. So I'll try not to say that this time, because this show is a slow burn, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Do not get me wrong. Uh, I think that has become a signature of the work. Whenever I complain about a show being slow-paced, and someone's like, oh, like The Walking Dead, for example, and someone's like, oh, you just don't like slow pace. You have no patience. You just want blah, blah, blah. I always hold up Better Call Saul as the example of slow pace done right, and to prove that I do like slow pace, and I can like slow pace if it's done correctly, which Better Call Saul most certainly does, and that is one of his key signatures, one of the things I love it, so I never want it to change. That being said, I'll try not to say it, but this episode, I would say when this episode ended, I was like, I thought we were only 20 minutes through. I was like, ah! It's over already? No, you can't be serious. It can be over already. It's barely even got started. Um, which, again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's, it's, it's actually a good thing. Although, if I had the patience and if I didn't want to review every single episode, I would say Better Call Saul is the show that's probably better to binge. This is probably like the key show that you would want to binge because it is so... like. <laughs> Each, it is not episodic at all. It's like the least episodic show I've seen because all the stories just blend together with each episode. And this, this episode in particular felt like a fraction of the story that they're about to tell. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that is a bad thing or not going to show in the slightest. Uh, I'm just saying, like, if I would have had the patience or maybe they should have, like, released it all in one go like Netflix does. But whatever. It's fine. I this great episode. Anyway, let's let's get into this episode. Of Smoke, because um, and again, this is another thing I love about Better Call Saul is because a lot of shows would like sort of just yada yada or skip over what this episode covered, particularly with the Jimmy McGill finding out about his brother Chuck dying and going to his funeral. A lot of shows would kind of yada yada through that, and I, that's what I love about uh, Better Call Saul is that they don't, is that they focus, they, they uh, you know, they draw, you, you know, some people might call it s slow or drawn out, but they show you the intense details and important moments like this, and I love that. I actually hate it when shows, like, I talked about Game of Thrones Season 7, how I wanted to see Cersei find out that, uh, that her, that Tyrion had joined Daenerys, and they kind of yada yada through that, and the first time we see her in Season 7, she already knows, which pissed me off. So I love that Better Call Saul does not do stuff like that. It, it shows you, and I think these are important things to see. Like, because, to be frank, like, some shows would have just started with Saul after after the funeral, or at the funeral, and skip the whole him actually going to Chuck's house and learning about it. Or some might even go from after the funeral and be like, oh, whoa, that, that was a sad funeral, or whatever. You know, it's true. A lot of shows would do this. And I love that Better Call Saul doesn't do it, and that we actually see. And I think, like, the details are what make this show great. Like, there's so much... Uh, and subtext, and I'm going to be frank, with this episode, 
I'm not going to speculate too much what everything means because I'm sure I'd get it wrong because I, to be uh, honest, I'm not completely certain on what's going on because there's so much like of the story we haven't seen yet. Like I said, this is just a peek of what is to come. And I've gotten other comments before my Better Call Saul reviews saying that my reviews have been very insightful and I do very much appreciate those comments and it does make me, uh, you know, uh, happy that people are enjoying my reviews. But I don't think this review is going to be all that insightful, to be perfectly honest, because I'm still sort of not entirely sure where they're taking uh, these characters and what everything means in this episode just yet, but I'll give it a go anyway. So, uh, let's, I already start talking about uh, Jimmy McGill and his uh, storyline with his brother dying, so let's get into that. Uh, this, <laughs> I thought, was very interesting because throughout the episode, you see Jimmy is in a very, like, out of it state. It appears to be that he's very upset over his brother's death. Uh, that he's uh, this really hit him very hard, but at the end of the episode, you kind of see something that maybe reveals that that's not necessarily the case. Because I love the scene when uh, you know um, Howard is reading him the eulogy on the phone. He's just turning on forever and ever. And again, this is another key signature scenes of Better Call Saul that they do so well. Um, and Jimmy just eventually just puts the phone down and, and sits away and then we get that sequence of him and Kim sitting on the couch where you know they're just drinking and then it flashes goes forward in time Jimmy's still just sitting on the couch um but and at the funeral we you know everyone comes up and says their condolences and he's just kind of like in a daze the whole time just showing how uh, this has affected him but what's interesting, and let's just get right to this ending scene where Howard, like, is very upset, he's crying, and he goes to uh, Kim and, and uh, Jimmy, and it's like, look, I have to come clean, I have to reveal what happened between us, that I forced Chuck out of the company, uh, and this is, that he was doing fine, it wasn't the trial, because Jimmy might have thought it was the trial and his testimony that, that put Chuck on this path towards even though like they never say outright it was suicide chuck i mean howard brings up that he believes it was suicide i think i think jimmy knows or at the very least jimmy knows that he relapsed into his you know electric phobia thingy which causes death whether it was intentional or not so jimmy would in a way blame himself for the trial and howard makes it clear it's not the trial that he was fine after the trial he was like listening to music and you know going jogging and stuff and had nothing to do with the trial it, the switch wasn't until howard forced him out uh, of the company now I did talk about this a bit in the finale how I actually a lot of people seem to side with Howard where I didn't I could actually see Chuck's perspective as well I actually I know I put some of the blame I do put some of the blame on Howard and I think that they were both being uh, you know stupid and thick-headed instead of working out the differences and I actually think Chuck's response of trying to sue Howard or whatever was uh, logical i think mean, i'd do the same thing in this place because i don't think howard had any right to shove him out of the company that was that he helped build but regardless of any of that um howard now feels guilty because he feels like it was his fault which i actually think <laughs> it is kind of in the way uh that he helped push uh, that pushing Chuck out has caused him to, and what Howard firmly believes is suicide, which we know it was because we saw the scene. Uh, and Jimmy's response is really interesting because he just says, well, Howard, that's your cross the bear. And then he goes and makes anyone want some coffee. And it seems like he's out of the days. Like he's been in his days, like for the whole episode, like that he's completely distraught and destroyed and it seems like Howard saying that uh, has knocked him out of the haze now another interesting aspect of this is Howard brings up the insurance uh, the because the whole feud between Howard and Chuck began because the insurance raised the rates ridiculously because the insurance found out about um, 
Chuck Simpson in the courtroom, we know, nobody else in the, you know, in the characters know, but uh, Jimmy knows and the audience knows that that was Jimmy's fault, that Jimmy instigated the insurance company. He's the one to let it slip accidentally, which of course he did totally on purpose, that Chuck had the outbreak. So the whole thing about the insurance rates raising um, was Jimmy's doing. So Howard's blaming himself, but Jimmy actually set this in motion. Jimmy was the one who set this whole thing into motion by having the insurance company uh, raise the rates, which led to Howard forcing Chuck out of the company, which led to Chuck uh, taking his life. So in a way, uh, this was uh, Jimmy's fault, and yet he feels totally better about it. So... This is interesting. This this makes me think that Jimmy wasn't actually upset over Chuck's death. Or he wasn't blaming himself. He wasn't worried that, oh, I caused Chuck's death. It seems to me that this reveal shows that he was worried people would blame him. And so when Chuck reveals that he blames himself, or Howard, sorry, when Howard reveals that he thinks it's all his fault, that relieves Jimmy, because now people can blame Howard instead of blaming him. So that's what I got out of that. Uh, but, I mean, if you look, and I've covered this a, a lot in my reviews of Better Call Saul, uh, if you look at the way that Chuck has historically treated Jimmy, I was totally on Jimmy's side, and I thought Chuck was a bastard. I kept talking about how uh, he's an asshole, and he's very petty, and he's doing this for petty reasons. And so from that perspective, and I don't take any of this back just because he killed himself, just to be clear. I mean, it's tragic. His death is tragic, of course, but that doesn't make him any less of an asshole for all the previous stuff he's done. Now, so from that perspective, I can kind of see why Jimmy maybe wouldn't be that broken off of his brother's death or all the bullshit that he put him through. I mean, he's still his brother, and maybe he did feel some some of that, like, days that he was in was because of that. It wasn't solely just the fear of people blaming him for Chuck's death. But I think the fact that that fear of, you know, people blaming him for Chuck's death is now gone is what made him feel better, is what relieved him. And just the way he said that to Howard, is like, well, Howard, because it seems like Howard's obviously looking for forgiveness. He was looking for resolution that he, Howard, was he was in pain, and he was completely broken up, and Jimmy had the, you know, the power to be, I forgive you, and to ease his pain, but instead he's like, well, Howard, that's just your cross the bear. <laughs> and it's like, uh, let's get some coffee. And also, like... But on the other hand, like, Jimmy could have been like, oh, well, screw you, Howard, you killed my brother, blah, blah, and would have, could have been really angry and made Howard feel even worse. So it wasn't like Jimmy was doing it to make Howard feel like shit because he could have done a lot worse to make Howard feel worse. But he was very indifferent. And I think maybe that... You could tell the look on Kim's face that she was shocked by Jimmy's <coughs> indifference and in his behavior about this. Uh, and just the way that Jimmy just so casually dismisses it. Well, I guess that's your cross the bear or whatever. I love that scene. I thought that was great. Yes, and of course, I actually forgot to talk about the opening scene of the episode because this is the season premiere of Better Call Saul and every season premiere has to start out with these black and white sequences that are like flash forwards, however you want to call them, present time, whatever, where it takes place after Breaking Bad, <coughs> where Saul or Jimmy is now Gene, hiding out in Omaha as, as uh, manager of Cinema Bun. And this one takes off pretty much right where the last, last one left off, where he had uh, proclaimed himself, like he saw this guy getting arrested, he's like, get a lawyer! And being all lawyer-like and telling him what to do, and that freaked him out, and he fainted, and this takes place after he faints, and he goes to the hospital, you can tell he's like really on edge, you get to see, uh, like he's just really jarring when like the doctor rushes in, and, like freaks him out, <laughs> it sounds like he's really worried, and then you get this long drawn out scene where the receptionist is checking his social security insurance and stuff and it's like oh this doesn't quite add up and asking him questions you can tell he's really freaked out he's scared it's kind of they draw out the tension like it's supposed to be a tense scene like they can figure out who he is but it turns out to be pretty benign but then you get the cab ride home and that was 
it's freaky. Now, they've done fake-outs before, like I think in the very first episode, where they had this you know guy show up and look like he was ominous and going to trying to scope him out, but it then turned out to just be some random guy meeting his family there. And so they've done fake-outs before, but this cab... Don't know if this is a fake out or not, because this was really eerie. Like, that guy was acting really creepy. I mean, if he was just a normal cabbie, why, why was he acting so fucking creepy? And he had that, you know, thing for the, from Albuquerque baseball team indicating he's from Albuquerque. So I think, I don't know, to me this is a clear sign that they, um, that there was people catching up to him because maybe and i think this is what uh gene or Saul or whatever jimmy whatever you want to call him is thinking is that they uh his calling out oh get a lawyer has drawn attention and people are like ah oh, this guy here he's acting like a lawyer he's supposed to be a manager at the cinema button and that's what he's thinking anyway uh and he's freaking out so he gets out of here he's like let me out i'm good let me out here so he gets out of the cab uh but the cab just stays there and like watches him and it's just really eerie has like he wasn't going through the green light he's like oh the light's green and he wasn't going and he's just staring at him through the window and um, the mirror sorry that was just fucking weird so <laughs> this is a different direction i thought they would take these these black and white things uh mostly because black and white things have been building towards him reclaiming his identity as Saul and wanting to be Saul again, but this is sort of showing the consequences of being Saul again. Uh, so having that pushback and showing there's a reason why he abandoned that identity in the first place, because his life is in danger. I still believe these are building up to the, that we're going to get the resolution to all these black and white scenes at the end of the show. It's very interesting how they drop one at the start of each season. Uh, but I do think it's going to finally build to, at the very end. And we're going to flash to this times. I don't think it's going to happen this season. There's been no announcement that this is the final season of the show. In fact, I watched an interview with the showrunners. And they were saying, oh, we don't know when the show is going to end. Which kind of irritates me. But they said the same thing about Breaking Bad. And that ended beautifully. So, <laughs> hopefully it'll be the same case here. I'm thinking season 5, but who knows. Uh, so, anyway, let's move on. Um to the Gus and Nacho stuff. Again, this, we didn't get much progression uh, in this storyline. Now, in my review of the finale, I talked about how I, I think it's pretty, personally, I think it's really obvious that Gus knew, knows about Nacho, knew about Nacho, that Nacho was planning to kill Hector or, you know, sabotage his pills or whatever. Uh, and we do get confirmation on that, which I thought was pretty obvious anyway, at the end of the episode where we see Gus's right-hand man following Nacho and has, you know, has a little tracking device planted on him. So he's following him around. He could see, he saw Nacho throw the pills in the river. Um, and so... So yeah, so that's no, we have confirmation on that. But I did, if you recall from my review all those months ago, I did have a theory that not only did Gus know uh, that Nacho was going to try to kill Hector, he helped it. Like because uh, because uh, Nacho's plan was to use the pills. But at one point in the finale, Nacho was like, it was too urgent because uh, Hector was going to kill his father, so he needed to kill him right away, so he was going to just go right out and shoot him or something. It's been a while since I've seen the episode. But uh, Gus interrupted, or not Gus, but it was like Hector's other goon showed up and interrupted Nacho before he could kill him. Now, I said that I thought that uh, Gus purposely did that uh, to stop Nacho from killing Hector the same way he stopped um, Mike from killing Hector way back in season two. Uh, and and it had that same sort of feeling to this. It's not that like Gus didn't send the goons directly, like he didn't call them and say, hey, go get Hector, but he called the meeting uh, with, you know, with Hector through Don Lario or whatever, so he knew that the goons would be sent to stop Nacho uh, you know, to get Hector, which would stop Nacho from killing Hector. Uh, so he knew by calling the meeting, that would stop Nacho from killing Hector. And at the meeting, he did everything he could to piss 
uh, Hector off and get him very upset so that Nacho would have the perfect opportunity to do the pill swap, uh, which he did. So I think uh, Gus did help Nacho to kill Hector. Now, what exactly will Gus's plans be for Nacho in the future? Uh, that is the big question, because it just, just because he helped Nacho out doesn't mean that they're buddies. I mean, Gus is a really calculated, cold calculated uh, crime lord, or not lord, but you know what I'm saying. Gangster guy. So, it's not like he's going to do things out of charity, but he could possibly use Nacho for his own purposes. He could see him as a chess piece. That would be useful in the future, so I'm not convinced that, uh, that he's going to kill him or anything like that. And plus, uh, I think Nacho's going to stay on the show. From all the promotional material, he's such a good character. It'd be good to keep him around. But I, and, but I think there's more in line with Gus's character. That he's going to use him more as a chess piece. And now, as we saw when, uh, you know, Nacho and uh, Hector's other goons met with... Uh, the big boss, Don Ilaria, and, uh, or was that his second? Yeah. Anyway, and he was saying, look, like, uh, Hector's out, but we can't let his businesses go, uh, you know, by the wayside. We have to keep things as normal. We have to keep things flowing. So I'm trusting you guys to take over and do it. Uh, so now Nacho will be in the position of power that Gus can further manipulate. Uh, my opinion. And of course, there's also the threat they mentioned that now with Hector in the weakened state, that could uh, incite war with the arrivals, which would bring in the DEA. And it seems like the way Gus was saying that, it seems like he has a plan, because he always has plans, but he'd have a plan to ensure that there isn't war because that would be bad. That would be chaos, as he said. That would be bad for everyone. So, again, just a fraction of the story, so I have no idea where they're going with this, so I'm very curious curious to see where this is going. But I do believe, strongly believe, that it will involve Gus using Nacho as a chess piece, my opinion. Anyway, uh, final storyline, let's get to Mike. Uh, this is another thing I'm not completely, like, I don't know what to say about this because I'm not completely sure... Uh, it is going to be made clear in the next couple episodes. I'm still not completely clear on what the hell he's doing. I did like how they had that hose where it's squirting water and he's playing with his niece because that's a callback because he used that hose to like uh, to <laughs> make a you know uh, smuggling drug smuggling truck crash and what, what he told his you know his daughter-in-law. Oh, I'm just making it to be for the garden, and it turns out he did use it for the garden as well. Um, and it also, I love seeing the scenes with him and uh, you know his uh, niece. Did I say niece? Oh, God damn it, granddaughter, granddaughter. My mistake. His granddaughter and his daughter-in-law. Uh, seeing those scenes uh, are really uh, good. I like seeing them together. But anyway, um, yeah. So Mike, he's get he quits his job because he doesn't need the money because he's got like you know he's got ten thousand dollars or so, lots of money from the magical uh, company, which, if I recall, is from a deal that he did with Gus. But it's but then we see him like go undercover into magical and like <laughs> i thought that was a very funny scene and he was just going around pointing you know uh pretending to be someone else and there was that argument brought up between who would win the fight bruce lee and uh muhammad ali and mike just couldn't help himself and had to be like oh god and had to say are you crazy bruce lee he wouldn't win unless he had a gun uh, which was a cool moment and how they it's like they don't even know who this guy is and they're like hey can you sign uh this card birthday card and it's, it's so interesting this is why i love better call Saul so much is that they can make a scene of someone at uh, signing a birthday card be really intense <laughs> because it was a suspenseful intense because you thought, oh, they're going to find out. He's going to be found out uh, by signing this card. But apparently it wasn't. I, that's what I love about this show. All, all the details like really work. But anyway, um, 
We find out that it wasn't that because Mike reveals himself anyway. He gives the stolen ID card back to the guy and he even goes to the boss, the manager, and points out all the shit that he's done. Just being, look, I'm your security consultant because officially he is uh, receiving money for being a security consultant. But really that was just Gus's way of uh, laundering the money because you can't say, oh, give him the money from drug lords. That's the whole thing about this company been established on Breaking Bad is a laundering things for Gus's drug enterprise to do it through this legitimate business. So I don't know what the hell Mike's end game is here. Is it? Is he trying to sh prove to Gus that he's worth that he that he's uh, useful and that he's uh, like would be useful to him and a good employee, or is it just the fact that he doesn't like because? This is another thing. When he got that scene where he was looking at his paycheck, and he saw his paycheck, I could see the the pride swelling up on him. And this is a major flaw on pretty much all the main characters in Better Call Saul, especially Mike. Mike might be the worst offender. The major flaw is pride. You see, and I've gone through this throughout the series again and again, you see these characters' pride. And this is also a thing with Walter White on Breaking Bad as well. So it seems like a common theme in this this, this universe here. Uh, but it's definitely true of Mike where the pride is just a huge issue for him and as soon as I saw him look at those that check with those numbers I was like oh here we go again his pride is going to get in the way blah 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 so I think maybe that is has a lot to do with this maybe he just doesn't like receiving all this money for nothing that he wants to feel because of his pride he wants to feel useful he doesn't want to just sit on his ass and get money for free he wants to actually do stuff uh, I hope there's, I think that is definitely an element to it, but I do hope there's more to it than that. But as I said, uh, still not sure what's going on, so I'm very curious to see where they take this from here. Anyway, my rating for Smoke out of 10 is an 8. Extremely good, a uh, good episode, good premiere, as I said, kind of a fraction of the story, but what we see in it is all top-notch. Features like the slow burn that Better Call Saul is absolutely excellent at. I uh, get a lot of great, I like the cinematography is used as a storytelling device more so than pretty much any other show I can think of. And so that's, we definitely get that, like the thing with signing the birthday card and the, um, you know, drinking the shots and having the time uh, fade in and out and, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, Jimmy McGill getting coffee after Howard <laughs> made this huge confession. Hey, who wins coffee? I love that scene. Anyway, that is it for my review of Smoke. I will be back here every week to review Better Call Saul, so be sure to check out check that out. Also, I cover many other shows on my channel like Star Trek Game of Thrones, The Expanse, and more, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching.